We're going to make fun of some shit. And we'll talk about the, uh, it's called Scarpamal tonight. And um, let's skip over that first part. We're going to talk about old camping trip. We're going to talk about Mr. Loki himself. And it's mm -hmm. an interesting dynamic. Yeah, sit down and learn something, boy. He said he began the story at the point where three of the Aesir, Odin, Loki, and Honir, departed from home and were wandering over mountains and wastes, and food was hard to find. All right. That's a hell of a scene. So you're walking around with the old boy that shaped it all. I don't think I'd be worried about a damn thing. But when they came down to a certain dale, they saw a herd of oxen, a herd of oxen, and they took one ox and set about cooking it. Now, when they thought it must be cooked, they broke up the fire and it was not cooked. After a while had passed, they'd scattered the fire a second time and it was not cooked. They took counsel together, asking each other what it might mean. So let's say you're three men camping in the woods and you're trying to get a fire hot enough. I don't know if you've ever seen three dudes trying to start a fire, arguing about how it works, but it's some funny shit, right? So here's Loki, you know, oh, Odin shaped it all, but watch this, I got it, you know. <laughs> I see it shaping up quite ugly. But there is, uh, then they heard a voice speaking in the oak up above them, declaring, he who sat there confessed he had caused the lack of virtue in fire. They looked thither, and there sat, on, there sat an eagle, and it was no small one. Then the eagle said, if you are willing to give me my fill of the ox, then it will cook in the fire. They ascended to this. Then he let himself float down from the tree and alighted by the fire, and forthwith, at the very first, took unto himself the two hams, the oxen, both shoulders. So I don't know if y'all ever seen a peacock walk into a bar, but that's kind of what we got here. You know, three dudes arguing about how to cook a piece of meat from a herd of ox. One of them shaped everything. The other one's trying to show off because he wants to prove something. And there's some jackass sitting in the tree talking about, I got this. I'll walk in here like John Wayne, and here we go. So it's not shaping up very good. And uh, people like that, you get in those kind of situations. Ooh, slippery. Yeah. No? <laughs> after, it's like big bar after midnight. You know, all those guys that have figured out they're not going to take anybody home, that's when they start fighting. So it's about the same kind of setup, same mindsets at play here. <clears throat> so the eagle took all the meat, right? And it was no small one, okay? And then Loki was angered. So he snatched up a great pole, brandished it with all his strength, and drove it at the eagle's body. And you remember, they took that ox from a herd of ox. That means there were many more. Odin has a spear that never misses what it's thrown at and always kills what it hits. It shouldn't be a problem to get another ox. But Sugar Bitches decides to get a case of the red ass about it, and uh, he's going to stab that eagle with all his strength. Well, the eagle plunged violently at the blow and flew up so that the pole was fast to the eagle's back and Loki's hand to the other end of the pole. The eagle flew at such a height that Loki's feet down below him knocked against stones and rock heaps and trees, and he thought his arms might be torn from his shoulders. He cried aloud, entreating the eagle urgently for peace, but the eagle declared that Loki should never be loosed unless he would give him his oath to induce Idun to come out of Asgard with her apples. So I have a friend, a very good friend, and he has the funniest story. You know, these guys are all in high school and they want to make a name for themselves. Well, in high school, there's only one way to do it. You're going to get in a fight with somebody. You're going to have to stroke. You're going to have to hook it up, lock horns, do whatever you got. Well, this one friend hadn't been in one yet. And he, uh, with his, all his other buddies, they've been in fights. They all won. They all come out on top. They all got in there and bare knuckle brawl it out for what boys do in high school, except for this one guy. Well, he was feeling the pressure of it. So we thought, you know what? I know exactly who I'm going to beat up. So we decided to pick on a mentally disabled kid. And I don't know what you know about mentally disabled teenagers, but they do not have a half gear. They come at you with that full on retard strength and they will hurt you. And so, on the bus, this kid decides to make a name for himself by jumping on this mentally disabled boy. Well, this mentally disabled boy ah, just loses it and begins to whip his ass. 
That's exactly what's happening here. Loki thought he was going to come out on top. I'll stab this eagle in the back. And the eagle's like, no, I got something special for your ass. Now he's in the trouble. Now he's got to make a deal. Ivan's not his to give away. This isn't the first time he's done this kind of thing. So his ego got the best of him and got him cornered in a situation he didn't have. My daddy always told me, he said, Brian, don't ever grab a hold of something you can't let go of. <laughs> I wish I'd have paid more attention to that. But be that as it may, this is the problem with those people that are driven by ego. This is the problem with those people who think more of themselves than they really are, who've never accomplished anything. You're sitting here having trouble starting a fire in front of a dude that shaped the world, can't get this thing to cook. John Wayne shows up and shows everybody how to do it. Then he takes most of it for himself. That is all kinds of injury to the guy that thinks more of himself than he really is. It's just an ass whooping all the way around, a mental abuse. Um, now he's going to do anything he can to save face. See, the one old boy wants Iden for himself and her apples, an apple of youth, to keep him young. <laughs> Loki agrees to it. Well, she's not his to give away. But that doesn't really matter when you're protecting that image we create of ourselves. Now, it doesn't really matter. I'll save face, as it were. And that's what's going on here. And I see it happen a lot. I don't see it happen so much anymore because the people I hang out with are not of that character, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> but Loki assented and being straight away, loosed, went to his companions. Not for that time or any more things reported concerning their journey until they had come home. Well, nothing else recorded because everything we need to know about the mindset of that individual is right there. Let's see what I do here. All right, there we go. So everything we need to know about this tale has already been told. There's this interesting thing about how things are woven together. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, if you possess the wisdom of the words that you read, that comes from a mentor. That comes from someone that has greater wisdom than you, sharing with you, how might we best perceive this? What are we supposed to be learning? I mean, I've said it a thousand times, a few people can tell me what the number one New York Times bestseller was 10, 5, 15 years ago. This thing's still around. People are still reading it. Millions of people are still reading this book. Why? Because there's something in between those words that mean a heck of a lot more than just what we're reading here. Something resonates within us. Something we can identify with. Something we see. Something that was about us. And if we possess a uh, uh, a proper connection and insight, we might begin to see that I see some of that in me. And I do. I don't always like the answers I get when I begin to examine my motivations. Sometimes it's really, I'm like, I should be further along than that. No, not really. You're still just a dude. Who the fuck do you think you are? I mean, these are the kind of things we got to deal with. <laughs> so Loki is going to make a deal with something He's going to give something away that's not his. That is, there's no really other way to look at that. Perhaps you could call it narcissistic. I'm still learning about that. And Karen, I haven't forgot about our discussion. <coughs> but there's, there's aspects of that I see in people all around bargaining for things that, that really aren't theirs to give away. But if they can talk about it in such a manner, they might seem more important in their eyes, gain a little esteem. It's that one-upsmanship. It's always somebody trying to top the other guy. It never comes out well, okay? But at the appointed time, Loki lured Aiden out of Asgard into a certain woods, saying that he had found such apples as would seem to her, of, to, to her to be of great value. Pray that she would have her apples with her and compare them. So he's straight up lying about shit. That's the interesting thing about the digital age. While we do have access to this kind of information, it's very hard to lie to people when all that information is available. See, if I came to you right now, I said, look, the Arkansas black is one of the best tasting apples you ever have as compared to a Granny Smith. You can look it up. You can go to the grocery store and buy it. <laughs> and if you're talking about finding a girlfriend or a boyfriend, 
Tinder is an exceptional application to swipe left or swipe right, take a look, there you go, hook up and we found it all. Um, nothing of quality comes of that. It seems to be a magnification of deceit sometimes at a, at a magnificent, almost uncontrollable level. It's more information than we can process, isn't it? More information than we can understand. It's too much, it's an overload, it's a constant bombardment. And yet here we are with a lifeline of a collection of words put to paper a thousand years ago or so that are much older tales than that. Probably here to save our ass. <coughs> so he lured her out into the woods. Then Theology the giant came in there in his eagle's plumage and took Iden and flew off, flew off, flew away with her. Off into Thrymimir to his abode. So he stole her. Wasn't Loki's to give. He lied, cheated, and stealed to protect his image, to save face, to save his own ass. He didn't care what kind of damage it would cause to everybody else. He was, it didn't matter what happened to her, as long as he was okay. Didn't have the courage to stand up and duke it out. Didn't have the courage to stand up and try to knuckle up, bear up under the load, stand up under the strain. Well, I'll just kind of screw that person over and I'll save the face. A lot of times it happens as polite character assassination at the water cooler, in the office, at work. Well, they didn't do that. Every time somebody new shows up to a job, well, they're going to nitpick. Well, he didn't do that right. And I'm going to spend an awful lot of time trying to fix that. My gosh, he ought to know better than that. That polite character assassination really has no business amongst heathens, ostatrues, pagans, however you want to perceive it. Ours should be legitimately a, a straightforward course of integrity nothing else. I mean, whether we like it or not, we are the prime example of what it means to be something different to everyone around us that's not following that path. We don't have the luxury of taking the inventory of other individuals or sacrificing their image so we might seem better. Only thing we get to do is go in there and do it right. That's, that's the real challenge in all of this. That's the real challenge to standing up and being a man or a woman about some of this stuff, putting our best foot forward doesn't mean sounding off about it at the expense of someone else. And yet all too often, that's exactly the kind of attitude you'll see. Gods know I would love to do that with a bunch of people. But again, like I say, for some reason, I seem to be blessed with a bunch of good people around me. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I got the freedom to be me. I ain't always had that. It was a time when I had no choice but to sacrifice somebody else's ego to protect mine because I hadn't accomplished anything. Even though I'd done a bunch, I didn't measure up over here, I didn't measure up over there, I wasn't good enough over there. Now all of a sudden I found myself surrounded by solid people where I could just simply be me. The good, the bad, the ugly. And there's a lot of freedom in that. Two of my favorite people made, said things tonight that I've just one of them said her heart was so full, and the other one said, oh, hell, I forgot what it was. But I digress. Let's continue on with the story because I got another important note I want to talk about. All that is incidental. All that's about growing up. All that's the blessings that Groa offered her son about being a man to find that woman that he loved. <laughs> He's got none of that. But the Aesir became straightened at the disappearance of Aiden, and speedily they became hoary and old. Then those Aesir took counsel together, and each asked the other, what had last been known of Aiden? And the last that had been sent was that she had gone out of Asgard with Loki. Thereupon Loki was seized and brought to the thing, and was threatened with death or tortures. So they're not fooling around. And when he had become well frightened, he declared that he would seek after Aiden <coughs> in Jotunheim if Freya would lend him the hawk's plumage which she possessed. One of the constant arguments I see about my, 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 the way I point out what he is amongst the Aesir, that wild ego, the personal image, the image that we carefully craft of ourselves, the ego run amok, is that, well, he, gets, he always gets him out of it. Well, it's not the fact that he gets them out of it. The fact of the matter is, if he'd been doing right to begin with, he wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be in that situation. It's a constant warning. This is, this is, not, <coughs> this is not about, excuse me, 
stupid cedar. <coughs> this is not about how he gets them out. The fact that it's a warning sign. You see, when these old people, these elders are telling the youth these tales, they're not, they're telling them how not to act in every bit as much manner as they are how to act to be an important member of this community. So if you give away something that ain't yours, specifically one of the most beautiful aspects of Asgard and that tribe of the Aesir, if you bargain that off to save your ass because you've got your tit in the ringer, well, you're probably going to be facing death or torture. In today's world, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to be recognized for what you are. You probably end up in jail, so on and so forth, or beat up. You know, that happens too. But we get to it. So now he's going to try to do it. Now, notice he doesn't have what it takes to get them out of that situation of his own. No matter how great he thinks he is, he ain't got what it takes as a man to go handle business. That's important to recognize. So he got his butt in the ringer. Now everybody's suffering because of his stupid mistake. And they're like, you're going to have to fix this. He ain't got what it takes to fix it. <clears throat> well, who's he have to ask? A woman. He's got to go to Freya, and he's got to borrow that hawk plumage. So if Freya would lend him the hawk's plumage, which she possessed, and when he got the hawk's plumage, he flew north into Jotunheim and came on a certain day to the home of Theazi the giant. Theazi had rode out to sea, but Iden was home alone. Loki turned her into the shape of a nut and grasped her in his claws and flew his utmost. That's a real important line. And I, I see that mistake commonly among men and women today. I've made it. Come across home, the Aussie had rowed out to sea, but Iden was home at, at home alone. So sometimes when a man finds a woman that they think they love, and more often than not, it's just a case of thwarted wanting or some kind of desire or some understanding of what we see on TV um, or trophy arm piece or a beautiful individual. And they're connected in some way, but very rarely is it right here. Um, that son of a bitch goes fishing. She's in a cage, pretty bird, to be seen and not heard, or she might whistle or sing. <coughs> She's in a cage. He goes fishing. Sometimes they write books and talk on the internet too damn much. Sometimes they spend too much time on the phone talking to other people. Sometimes they play video games all night long. Sometimes they the list goes on and on and on because we always assume that, well, she's in a cage and I'm providing this and I'm paying the bills. and I'm a man and everything is going to be all right. And she ought to be satisfied with who I am and blah, blah, blah. Well, that ain't the case. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When you look at the Svipdag Small and you look at uh, Sigurd and Brunhild, when they create an environment where she might express the beauty of who she is, <laughs> you've done something most men cannot accomplish. See, because we're scared of that. We don't know what that looks like. I have no idea what those feminine energies might appear at in my life. It's going to be wild and chaotic and out of control. If you look at the stories of Kali and Shiva, Kali's on a tear. She's like cutting off heads and wearing arms as a miniskirt and just generally raising hell. Shiva goes down. She is, she is all of the natural forces of the fear of death and sex and violence and nature that a man can't hardly live in anymore. She, when she gets, Shiva gets in his, in her way, that light meets that dark and something amazing happens. It takes both of them. It takes both of them together for Shiva to ascend to what he's supposed to become and Kali to become what she's supposed to become. And the same thing happens throughout our lore, too. <clears throat> now, in a day and age when this was written, you have to remember that most marriages were an arranged affair. Most marriages were between families in a community or a tribe to make the family stronger. It's always kind of a business arrangement. Only in Northern Europe did you see the rights to divorce the rights of women to hold property, the rights of many things, these freedoms, the ability to stand at the thing and speak. These things are very important. Um, simply being put in a cage and kept at home because she's pretty and makes you look good 
Why is that not also the ego of an individual? Whether or not she's happy seems to become irrelevant as long as I look good with her on my arm. Well, now we're talking about something good. So he goes fishing. Let me tell you something. Every man that I talk to, every man that I deal with, including myself, has this feeling somewhere in here. I can go do something bigger and greater. I can try to become something more. I have that same feeling. These women in our lives have that same feeling. We don't brand it. We don't know what it looks like. The only thing we can do is stand, sometimes stand there and just shake your head, yes, probably about the best thing you can damn do. <laughs> but they have it just as much as we do. And it manifests in all kinds of ways. But I promise you, if you put her in a cage, she probably will become a nut. <laughs> <laughs> and quite likely, you're going to call her crazy, and she's going to fly away with somebody else. And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> you know, that this kind of what sticks in my craw, though, is that that little line written all that time ago when marriages were arranged and consorts were on the side and were an accepted thing, as long as it didn't interfere with the business arrangement of the world, still has relevance in today's day and age when we have the luxury and the freedom to cultivate intelligent philosophy, understanding of these spiritual principles in a very comfortable atmosphere, in a safe atmosphere. And we've squandered it. We've put so much baggage on the word love that it's almost impossible to use. What kind of future might that hold for our children? Once again, here's a lifeline. Once again, here's something to pull us out of a great void that I see so many of my friends hanging around in. A great big empty place because they've tried it again and again and well, I can't quite seem to figure it out. Maybe that's not in my future. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just too dumb. Maybe I'm not woman enough. Maybe I'm not man enough. Because I promise you, you get in a tight enough situation with one of your partners, that's those exact words are going to come out. You ain't man enough. And you ain't woman enough. And blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> well, we have a woman right here. You can't simply put something in a cage and then go fucking fishing and expect everything to be all right. It takes work and it takes a real connection and it takes a lot of other things that I'll probably talk about in the new book. But <laughs> anyway, Loki turned her into the shape of a nut. Like I said, she went nuts and grasped her in his claws and flew his utmost. And she flew away with somebody else. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Now when Thiazi came and missed Aiden, he took his eagle's plumage and flew after Loki, making a mighty rush of sound with his wings in flight. But when the Aesir saw how the hawk flew with the nuts, where the eagle was flying, they went out below Asgard, bore burdens of plain shavings thither, and as soon as the hawk flew into the citadel, he swooped down close by the castle wall, then the Aesir struck fire to the plain shavings. But the eagle could not stop himself when he missed the hawk. The feathers of the eagle caught fire and straight away his flight east. Then when the Aesir were near at hand and slew Thiazi, the giant within the gate of the Aesir, and that slaying is exceeding famous. It's always a struggle. When you get in the middle of something trying to protect your ego because some woman has wounded your pride or some man has wounded your womanly pride, it's usually a huge, dramatic bonfire of the vanities kind of shit that everybody gets to pay attention to and everybody's going to know about. And you'll see the drama all over social media. They did this and they did this. And there's this big laundry list of things about how right this, how wrong this was and how they're, they're bad at this and bad at that. <clears throat> the eagle burning huge bonfire. That's what we're, how many times have you seen that on social media with people that we're roughly acquainted with? I don't know them from Adam. A lot of them. But by gosh, I know about their lives. <laughs> I know what kind of person they are. And uh, I will pass a judgment because I'm that kind of dick. <laughs> because I see it because right here I got told not to do it. Right here it says, don't do that. Don't do that. 
you better figure out another way. Here's a couple of other stories over here that kind of give some instructions. Let's try it like this and see what happens. And let's start by recognizing who we're dealing with, being present in this moment, being right here, right now. <laughs> in that moment, just before Odin died, when he sacrificed his ego, when he sacrificed himself to himself, in that moment before he died, he got to the song before he, before, when he's at the moment of death, I should say, not before he died, but when he's at the moment of death, he hears the songs of his ancestors. He finds the keys to the universe. He rids himself of the ego and becomes worthy of being Frigga's husband, that great weaver of just about everything we see. I don't care if you consider it an illusion or not. It's all woven together, just like a fine tapestry, albeit with energy. It's an amazing what Frigga really is. Not someone for Odin to fool around with. <laughs> his equal and opposing, complementing opposite. There's something neat to be found in that. You see it in Balder and Nana. Um, whatever they taught Balder and Nana, when they died, she went with him. Something very beautiful in that sacrifice. Some healthy connection, some well-rounded individual who inspired someone else enough compassion and love and all that. That's what we want to strive for. Not this egotistical dive bombing into the fire, burning of the ego because, well, I was cyber. All that nonsense can be translated into today's, into with things we see today. Our opportunity to ensure that our children don't have to go through the same kind of nonsense that we did at my age is rapidly escaping, right? <laughs> I got one little girl. I got a little boy. I got a boy too. Um, I got a grand. How do I teach them not to be like, like that? I've got these ancient tales. And they don't sound like a great story, don't they? But the point can be made because it's still being made to all of us today. <laughs> now, Scotty, the Aussie, took helm and all weapons of war and proceeded to Asgard to his father. The Asir, however, offered a reconciliation and atonement. So, when some of your people up, you can't always just gear up for war and go after them. Sometimes we got to recognize that you were in the wrong. We're not going to sell you out. We're not going to outlaw you. But now we've got to make atonement on this. Now we've got to make it right. Notice they didn't say, I'm sorry. They did something. They tried to do something to change the mind of the individual that was so grievous, so, so aggrieved by the loss of her father. There's no more tragic thing if you have a healthy relationship with your daughter to lose or to lose her father. My grandfather, my grandmother, my mom mentions it today. You know, my grandma was seriously hurt when she lost her father. Her favorite song was Dolly Parton's Daddy's Hands, you know, holding Daddy's hand. <clears throat> we have a real obligation to cultivate that kind of relationship because that's the first healthy relationship that a little girl has with a man is with her father. And if it's done right, if it's done, if it's done right, if it's done with love, the Aussie, Scotty, she will take up helm and burn in all weapons of war and proceed to Asgard to avenge her father, come hell or high water. Because there's a love there that's been interrupted. There's something there that's been, some, some ego has caused an immense amount of pain to a young, to a young lady. The Aesir understand that. The Aesir understand this failing. They offered a reconciliation and atonement. The first article was that she should choose for herself a husband from among the Aesir and choose by the feet only, seeing no more of him. And that brings me back to the arranged marriage kind of thing. So much of relationships in that day and age was by an arranged marriage to build the community stronger to reinforce the integrity of the tribe, to make it unconquerable. 
<coughs> that's what we're looking for here in that day and age. We want a tribe that's not going to be conquered. We want strong sons. We want powerful women. We want that kind of thing that will defend the integrity of this great, the cell wall of this structure. So these marriages were arranged. If they happened to like each other, so much more the better. Now the Aesir have that. They do happen to like each other, but they're not dumb. They also know that the Aussie is being, she's gone over the top, or Scotty, she's gone over the top. She is, she is consumed with grief at the loss of this very powerful, strong, and probably quite loving relationship. He don't know how to treat a wife, but he probably loves his little girl like everything else. Sun probably sit, rises and sets in her eyes as far as she's concerned. And she knows it, and that's gone. So the Aesir offer this sneaky kind of deal, don't they? You can pick a man by his feet. Feet are ugly. I mean, let's just be honest. They're just fucking jacked up, ugly feet. <laughs> Some people like them. I, they have at it, you know. <coughs> but if we look at that and take that to the next level, what happens when a woman only looks at one aspect of a man and picks him as a mate. Not just his feet, maybe it's just his pocketbook. Maybe he has a handsome face, maybe he has a strong body. Maybe he has wonderful glutes, who knows? And they use that to pick a mate. And what chance of success do we have at that? See, because we're not getting into these relationships in this day and age, to build stronger communities or tribes. Well, now all of a sudden we have freedom and comfort and luxury to build these relationships because of love. And somehow, like I said earlier, we've managed to put so much baggage with that damn term, it's almost impossible to do. What's it look like? What do you want from me? But to pick an individual on just one aspect of their being is a certain recipe for failure. <laughs> That's just one aspect of this relationship. So she goes and she looks at the feet. She saw the feet of one man passing fair and said, I choose this one. And Balder, little can be lovely. So Balder must have some, he must have a hangnail or toe, fucked up toe or some shit like that. It's good to know that he's not all the way perfect. I mean, he does have to travel through hell to figure out how to become what he's supposed to become. I mean, there ain't no easy task. He's going to make some sacrifice. <laughs> but all that sand on the beach, that's going to have some. Just like a nice sand scrub, like pretty feet, just shining all the time, like a surfer. But that was Njord of Noatan. So she wanted Balder, she got Njord. That puts her in a real interesting position. So this goddess of the snow-capped mountains is now engaged to the Lord of the Sea whose children literally represent abundance, prosperity, love, and, and everything else good and healthy that men could aspire or want. That's his children. That's his progeny. He himself, it says, controls fire and water. Well, my goodness, what kind of individual must he be? That must rival Odin himself to be able to stand in the middle of the, the void of Gnunen Gap and manipulate the fire and the ice into something. His realm is the sea, Odin is the dry land. Odin chooses to have his great feast in the sea where there's this great wonderful abundance of life, whales and octopuses and things that glow in the dark and have amazing senses and live to 400 years old and all of this abundance. You know, if you lived by the sea and could catch a fish, you'd never go hungry. If you could kill a whale, you'd have, fool, you'd have fuel and food and tools and implements. You could build a shelter. Imagine what one whale does for a small village. <coughs> it's an amazing place. It's a realm we can't hardly begin to understand. And yet, some of the greatest ex expressions of life, of the energy of life, find their most magnificent aspects in the sea. That's another thing. I think I gave another video on that. I know I've written about it extensively, but it, it captures my imagination every time I see it. <laughs> so this goddess of the mountaintop above the tree line, snow-covered mountain, what happens to that snow in spring? 
and forms a river and flows to the sea, where it evaporates, rises into the sky amongst the Aesir, and falls as snow on the mountain. It's a part of a cycle. It may be a simplistic expression of the understanding of how nature works, the, the, the movement of water through our atmosphere. There's far more water on this planet than there is dry land. So we have an important connection there to be made. But she had this article also in her Bond of Reconciliation. Now, this is a Bond of Reconciliation. This is not some fancy apology. This is not payment of wear guild or some other. This is a Bond of Reconciliation. One of our tribe has done wrong. We're going to do this to make right. So in their wisdom, we'd look at it first to say, well, that's just sneaky. But if she can grow and Njord can grow, I imagine what their child might look like because his first two are some of the greatest ideas of abundance that we, that we, that we worship. And I say worship that we make offering to Frey and Freya. What does their progeny look like? <coughs> well, we got to get to that point first, don't we? So I'll quit running my mouth. Okay. That the Aesir must do a thing she thought that they would not be able to accomplish, and that is to make her laugh. Then Loki did this. He tied a cord to the beard of a goat and the other end being around his own genitals, and each gave way in turn, and each of the two screeched loudly. <laughs> then Loki let himself fall onto Scotty's knee, and she laughed. Thereupon, reconciliation was made with her on the part of the Aesir. It is, it is so said that Odin did this by way of atonement to Scotty. He took the Aussie's eyes and cast them up into the heavens and made of them two stars. Her father will always be watching. What a beautiful thing to do. But if we go back to the first of that story where Loki's trying to prove how much of a man he is, because this guy seemed to have robbed him out of all that meat and he took more than he was he may have abused his privileges of hospitality as a guest and all that nonsense and he thought he would stab him in the back and he traded something off that wasn't his and his ego got out of the way and ran out of control well now mr egotistical himself has a goat tied to his nutsack and a woman laughed at him now i don't care who you are if some woman titters when she looks down there it's going to be a it's going to be a bad day I'm just, that's just the way it is. It's going to be bad. I'm just going to walk away and uh, keep on just next. <laughs> so Mr. Ego himself got giggled at when he had a goat tied to his sack. Um, there's a real sense of humility, humiliation there. Sometimes if we don't get control of our egos or how important we think we are, it can be just that dramatics to get knocked back into, into what we were supposed to be. Now, the seed of wisdom is, is, is understanding, okay, I've just had to deal with this, and I'm not what I thought I was, and I've, done a couple, I've made a mistake. Now, what do I do? Do I knuckle down on it and continue that line of thinking and insist that I'm right? Or do I grow up a little bit and say, okay, I bet, I bet I can figure out how to do a little bit better. Maybe I can grow a little bit. It might not be the outcome we want. It might not look like what we think it should. But if we do something better than we did the day before, that's growth. And Scotty was of a mindset that these people, I will not laugh. They took my father's life. I'm so angry. I'm so upset. I will slay them all. She got a husband. She got to make fun of the jackass that caused it all. And in that growth, however small it might be, there was a blessing from Odin himself that her father's eyes would always be watching. What an important thing to understand. What an important thing to understand for us, because it, it might not turn out the way we think it should. That doesn't mean we're less of who we think we are. It didn't change the color of our hair. It didn't change the color of our skin. Your eyes didn't change color. You didn't lose 10 pounds. You didn't put on 50. You're not shorter. You're not taller. But our ego will tell us that it, 
whatever violation it is, is every bit as injurious as just such a concept of our personal being. When we can step out of that, who knows what blessings we might have earned at this table that we like to feast at. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. I think a lot of the times they call that faith. Although if you use it in this crowd too often, and I'm not talking about the people here, if you use it in a large community, it's poo-pooed, which I think is a funny ass word anyway. It is ridiculed. I stand before my blah, 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 blah. But be that as it may, <laughs> I think we have a right if we're doing our best to grow and become something better, if we're trying to do better, if we're examining our motives of what we're doing, what do I expect to get if I'm acting this way towards this person? What am I hoping to get? Once we can eliminate that idea of hoping to get from how we act towards some person, there's all kinds of blessings that show up in your life. Once you eliminate that expectation of some boon or gift or some special attention from acting in a certain way towards someone and just go ahead and act a special way towards someone, there's a real, real neat thing that begins to occur. And it takes courage because they still might laugh at you. They still might ridicule you. They still may think you're a creep. <laughs> I mean, I have to ask myself on a daily basis, if I hadn't written all of the books that I've written, if I hadn't run my mouth for five, six years now on podcasts and YouTube and, in, and given live presentations and signed books and helped people, if I hadn't done any of that, what would it look like if I reached out to someone out of the blue and said, you know what? Keep trying. You can do it. If you need my help, just call. Would I get that same kind of attention? Flip a coin. Flip a coin. So I do understand the challenge of what I'm trying to suggest to people. I do understand the difficulty in it. But perhaps we should keep it simple and just start with ourselves. And for myself, I got to look at what I'm trying to do and make sure that I'm not doing something to build up my ego instead of build up something that might do somebody some good in the world. Maybe somebody will take something that I've written, they don't ever, if they never mention my name, if they never say a word about where it comes from, and they take it and they go and they become president or they go become a Supreme Court justice or they become a New York Times bestseller or they, maybe they just have a happy family. Why should I expect anything out of that? I didn't do any of that work. But I do hope that that is the result of everything I'm trying to do. That we do have that kind of success. <laughs> I don't give a fuck if I'm right. I like to see people be happy. And right now, I look around at my friends and people that I love, and I see some very beautiful people that are dealing with some pain that I find myself short of the tools necessary to help them make it through. <laughs> I asked about how to get in touch with Mike Tyson the other day because he, uh, he had an interview with Sugar Ray Leonard. I don't know Mike Tyson from Adam but I do recognize an individual in pain. And what I recognize is an individual that is using the wrong set of tools to try to deal with a situation that nobody is telling him how to deal with. Nobody's sharing with him, hey, it's a different playground. You're not in the ring, you're over here on the golf course. Use a, use, use the, use a driver instead of a wedge. You know, you don't need a towel out here, blah, 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 it's that kind of shit. <laughs> For every stage of our life, these stories in the prose and the poetic edda, whether you like them or not, is what we have to help us negotiate these stages of life. And the situations that arise in each one of them, including being able to handle loss and love and putting ourselves in the right frame of mind to be able to handle it in a healthy manner. 
It's not enlightenment. It's not nirvana. It's in this day and age, shit, it might simply be just learning how to be a decent human being to someone else. That changes the world, people. That literally changes the world. But it all starts with me examining my motivations. Why would I stab that evil in the back? Well, maybe I wasn't important in front of Odin. Well, I am not Odin. Why would I make a bargain with someone else's wife? See, there's a special place in hell for the deceivers of men's wives. Their hearts and souls are gnawed upon by Nidog and a pit of serpents. The deceivers of men's wives, the murderers, the adult, all that nonsense, the oath breakers. <laughs> if I examine my expectations, I come out with a very healthy way to look at how I interact with individuals. I also find myself with enough freedom to tell someone how much I care about them without them being terrified that I expect something from them. And that is a real secret. That's a real powerful thing. Um, I could not have achieved half of what I have done in this world if I wasn't, if I hadn't figured out how to do that. And sometimes it simply starts by telling someone that, you know, you hate their guts, the day they're doing better than you at everything you do. Um, man, that's a good job. That's awesome. And you'd be surprised at how many times they'll sit down with you and say, you know what, this is how I did it. Check this out, man. Man, I just built a friend. <laughs> we lose that sometimes. We lose that a lot. That's one of the importance of building a tribe. The, uh, I think that's about all I got. Because from here it goes into Posey and a bunch of other things that are every bit as important. But it is about how to communicate speech or word or talk of these giants. is a mouthful of gold. <laughs> But I think I'm done talking about all that. And, uh, you, oh, you know what? There's one other thing I want to mention, and this is really important to me, and I hope that you pay attention to it. There is a young lady here in Tulsa who is a, a fan of mine, who's read my books, and she is, if I can do it without getting choked up, we'll do it. I'll tell you about it. But I have her fundraiser posted on my timeline. And her name is Shelby Martin, and she has a GoFundMe. Now, she is niece of a friend of mine, okay? She is, she's 28 years old. While she was pregnant, well, actually, before she was pregnant, they discovered a lump, and they ignored it. They said, you're too young. That's not really an issue for you. And during her pregnancy, uh, it became a radical form of breast cancer, and there followed a radical mastectomy. During this battle with cancer, she brought forth a life into the world. <clears throat> she gave birth to a little baby girl. And now the child is two months old, and she is, uh, has several spots on her lungs and one on her liver, and they're looking at all of them. So if you would stop by my page, Scroll down, find it. Her name is Shelby Martin. And um, show some of that support. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people in a lot of situations in this world, but that's a hero. To be fighting cancer, to be fighting breast cancer, the very symbol of femininity and so much of what we perceive, and to bring a life into the world in the middle of that, that's double tough by any standard of measurement. So if you would, and if you can, go give her a little bit of love. Anybody, I'm, that's, that's it for me for tonight. Does anybody have any questions or any, any, anything they want to talk about? I'd be happy to help anybody out that wants to talk tonight while I drink my fucking Red Bull. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. Oh, I see you joined. I've been on here since a couple of, about 8.04. I wasn't paying attention. I was just running it to mouth. You know how I get it. <laughs> <Nah. laughs> Don't make me laugh too hard. It makes me cough and then I can't stop. <laughs> I don't want to do that. 
Be like Mick Jagger singing, stand back, he's fucking talking. <laughs> he want me to spread the coronavirus. <laughs> that old crony virus, that much of nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it's been a been an interesting day. Well, what do you got the coronavirus? Did you get stuck with it, Melissa? Well, fine, don't answer me. Yeah, probably not. You got frozen there. We missed you. I, don't know I, you I was asking if you got the coronavirus. Uh, it feels like I got the coronavirus. I thought I was going to die yesterday. <laughs> <sighs> My fucking yeah. ribs hurt so bad from coughing, I can't take it. Damn, Jeff sneezed 24 times in a row the other day. Jesus. I know, right? He's probably allergic to you. <laughs> no, that's just bullshit, but I got some of that too. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's what you get. Yep, that's what I get. <laughs> if you got anything, Brian, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Y'all have Man, I mean, didn't you post something? Ain't you got something coming up? Me? Yeah, you. Oh, yeah. We got a um, the uh, folk Second. family reunion. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. Yes, we're doing the folk family reunion. And um, last year we did it in Iowa. And it's a collaboration between Midhearth Kindred and um, Northern Blood Kindred uh, out of Minnesota. And... We're doing it in Kansas this year. Are we the Minnesota stayed, people coming? Because I'm telling you right now, if you haven't met some of the Minnesota people, you're missing out. They are awesome. You got to come up, Brian. You got to be there. We're staying at, it's a hunting lodge, basically, is what it is. It's freaking huge. It's on like 10 or 20 private acres. It's it's a lot. It's like a house in the middle of nothing. And, uh, I mean, like, you can seat 25 people at the table to sit down and have dinner together. It's phenomenal. So we're going to have a great time. Last year when we did it, we did um, just like a family reunion style games. We had tug of war. We had sack races. Everybody was dirty and sweaty and laughing. Oh, uh, I am far too serious to be indulged in simple games. Oh, gee. <laughs> well, maybe you can just come and keep score then, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, you I couldn't that, man. You were there well, with the hunting lodge and big round table. I got the feeling very aristocratic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were there with us, but you weren't there physically. You came in and did a, a presentation. We did it like this live over Zoom. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. yeah well, but it's, when is it? What's the date on it? It is July 30th through 2nd. It's a three day weekend, um, two nights, three days. And it's pretty affordable. I think it's like 140 bucks for the whole weekend. It includes your accommodations and all your food and everything else that we're doing for the weekend. I don't know how many people can go and do a weekend getaway for 140 bucks. Includes everything. So you there's sure discounts really? for couples and children are free. Yeah, you sure as hell ain't going to Disney World. I can promise you that. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Mel Melania was on here, and I was going to tell her, but if you haven't checked out Melania's art, you really should. Oh, her stuff is beautiful. I'm going to get a horn from her this year. I'm doing the same. I'm setting money aside for one, too. She's got a couple on there that I really want, man. I don't... Yeah, she's going to do it. And I don't, usually, I don't usually look at those kinds of things, but she puts something special into them. Yeah, she does. I, uh, I think it's really interesting because she's probably about the only artist of that caliber that we have right now in Ossetrue. And it's going to be very um, interesting to see what happens in the future with all of that artwork? I mean, we just don't, we don't have, okay, I'm not saying we don't have other artists because we do. Right. But there's something about her artwork that has a lot of really amazing energy and everything in it. And it's just, I don't know, it's beautiful. It hits me in my soul when I look at it. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, there's a couple, there's one horn in particular that I won't yeah. get to, I think. I don't, uh, what else? Are there any other events coming? Oh, we have an Ostara in the South next weekend, right? Ostara in the South is next weekend. Yep, I'll be down there for that one. And we are going to do an Ostara event the weekend of the 21st here in Springfield, too. Okay. 
Yeah, I saw. Did you see the pictures of Kevin and Megan's baby boy? Oh my God, it's so cute. Man, that is a beautiful child. They they did so good. They did good. In case you don't know, Kevin and Megan are just a couple of people. I, Kevin's also a Gothi for the Austria Folk Assembly, like I am. But he's a uh, he's a former Marine. He's done a couple of tours. Uh, I don't know if it's Iraq or Afghanistan, but he's he's no stranger to what it is. Um, got out, got in a pipeliner. I think he's a pipeliners union. Uh, now he teaches it. Exceptional welder. Works. He works his day, then he teaches at night, and um, he they've just done really good for themselves. This young couple just firing on all cylinders, and now they have this this baby, and it's just beautiful. And I've just when I, when I see that younger generation do that, and and I, there's, I think there's some others too, and they know who they are because I've told them. Then I see those young couples doing that. I'm just, it really makes me feel good about what we're doing here. And that's so fucking arrogant, but still, I, it ain't none of my business, but I just, I enjoy seeing people that are successful and happy. That's just it, man. That's who I want to be surrounded by. That's who I, those are the kind of people I want to hang out with. <clears throat> I've been that angry man. I've been that hateful person. I ain't got time for that anymore. Yeah, it's not that fun, really. <laughs> well, well don't, get no, no, Melissa, don't get me wrong. Melissa, Every now and again, I'll pull it out, take a little sniff of it, see if it still stinks. And it <laughs> Melissa, don't forget that you promised me happiness with the uh, fireside dance-off. Oh, yeah, we're dancing. We will be dancing, it'll start. Wait a minute, hang on. The way she said that, promised you happiness with the fireside dance-off. What the shit? <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a killer. I, nobody's going to be allowed to tape that because that could be like hell. <laughs> hey, you did me. That's a little funny talk. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, Anna Mae said she'll join us. She's down. <laughs> yep, us, us three are going to have the fireside dance off. It's going to be amazing. I'm good. Good. Yeah, Anna's coming. Anna's one of AFA get you. Let me tell you something. She's a fantastic woman. She's awesome. She's a. Uh, She's just impressive, and she don't say a whole lot, but when she says something, it's like, boom, there's a ton of bricks on your head, motherfucker. And uh, <laughs> she's all over the bed. <laughs> Me too. She's great. We're going to have a lot of fun next weekend, so I'm looking forward to it. I've been sick all this week, and I missed a whole fucking week's worth of work, and I'm like, I'm just going to borrow from the rainy day fund, and <laughs> I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, I missed a whole week's work when I went to the hospital for my blood pressure, and that that, that wasn't very fun. Well, as long as you got your shit under control, it's worth it then. It's just a pill, just like everything else. <laughs> as long as it's working. It is working. Good. It is working. It reminded me I really don't like what I'm doing. It's time to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I say that what I'm doing is easy. It's just a piece of cake. It's just me being lazy. <laughs> Has anybody else got any events or anything going on in their neck of the woods? That'd be fun to hear about if they do. Yeah. And you know what? That's what we're going to start doing, too. At the end of this, people got something coming up, and they want something to show up. We're going to throw it out there and let people know. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to shut this bad boy down so I can process this recording and get it uh, get it posted. And it's, cause it's time to put Scarlet to bed. Thanks, Brian. You have a good night. All right. You have a good And you know what? Thank you very much for posting that uh, for me the other day. I really appreciate that. Oh, you're most welcome. You deserve that. I appreciate you doing what you're doing. You know, I don't know if people realize how much of a, you know, for somebody to stay committed and do that every week at the same time and to come up with what needs to be said, it's not that easy. That's a commitment. And I appreciate it. I respect that. To figure out how to pass a digital hat. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all have a good night. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? I hear you. All right. I think my sound went off. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, you took control of it. Oh, I did. Yeah, because you had some uh, some background noise, and I was going to fix it for you while you were talking. It's probably just my, probably this rubber chair. I was going to fart in it, see if it got picked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might not need to hear that. 
<laughs> poor boy, he doesn't stand a chance when I get the yeah. <laughs> All right. I will talk to you later, man. I'm out. Y'all have a All good right. night. Have a good night. Bye. Good to see you around, Shay. It's good to see you, bud. Good to see you too, Brian. Good night.